and Okay, um, now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Ann Hazelrig is, is Extension, UVM Extension's best plant pathologist. Um, she's also the only, <laughs> the, only <plant> path one. <laughs> the only plant pathologist at UVM Extension. Um, Ann runs the plant diagnostic clinic and is the faculty lead for both the pesticide safety education program and our community horticulture program. So not only is she my esteemed colleague, but is she's my also my beloved boss. Um, <laughs> it's just getting you ready, Ann. Yeah, thank, right. you, thank you, Ann, so much for providing today's webinar. And I'll turn it over to you. Okay, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, this is going to be kind of a stream of consciousness talk for the next hour or so. Um, I just got, you know, some of your questions uh, from Deb, but um, hopefully I've covered most of it. So let's just go ahead and get started. And then, of course, if I don't cover something, please uh, just email me and ask me. Um, pictures are always great if you have questions. Okay. Now, let's try to... All right, I'm trying to move it forward, but uh, let's see. You might have to just click on your um, on your screen and then try to forward it that way. And well, oh, there you go. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. So these were some of your questions. Yeah, I'll try to cover a lot of them, but uh, I I missed some. So just email me if we don't cover it. So the big news, you know, this year, it kind of just seems like it's been one thing after another. Um, so the big news was, well, starting out, we had that really, really hot, hot temperature in May, that 90 degrees in May. But then uh, we also had a May frost, and that really sort of wreaked havoc across the state. It was very uh, hit or miss. It was really interesting to see... Um, you know, what was damaged, what wasn't. And in my yard, you know, like my smoke, this is a picture of my smoke bush got zapped, but the birch next to it was fine. So it just really depended on where trees and shrubs were in their um, leafing out phase on how, how much they got zapped. Um, so the biggest, uh, luckily for us, uh, veg growers, uh, we know, uh, better to put uh, than to put plants out before uh, about Memorial Day. So veg crops really didn't get too damaged. Although I talked to um, a nursery person that sells uh, garden plants and she said a lot of the new newbies that had moved here from COVID had bought plants early and had them already put out. So she said, well, I guess I got to make two sales <laughs> from those people because everything got zapped. So um, the biggest uh, crop damage was in apples and blueberries, and um, it was really hit or miss around the state, but you can always cut open the um, apple buds on, uh, that's the picture on the right, and if it's brown in there, they're dead. So uh, they're still trying to figure out how they're going to get crop insurance or, or get compensated for that. Uh, this was a picture that somebody sent in, a master gardener sent in uh, before this webinar. And this um, this is uh, called frost rings. And it happens on apples. If they were just uh, newly formed apples when that frost occurred, you get these rings around the fruit. So that's what uh, caused that damage that a uh, master gardener sent in. The plants are, I mean, the fruit is still fine to eat. I don't know if it'll uh, get to the a normal size. Uh, you could certainly use it for cider if it keeps growing. Uh, the other crop uh, that we lost were uh, grapes was another one and blueberries. Some, some growers lost their blueberries. Um, and so we saw a lot of frost damage in blueberries and frost damage can also look like a, um, a uh, fungal disease that's really bad in blueberries called mummy berry. And I just got a sample of that recently. So in mummy berry, it's a fungus disease. It causes, um, there are two phases to this um, fungus disease. The first one causes a shoot blight that looks a lot like frost. And then uh, there's a second phase that cause, that's a flower blight. And what happens is if the flowers were infected, 
uh, the berries sort of turn a pinkish purplish and don't really develop um, and then drop off the plant. And within those berries, the fungus produces a sclerotia, this um, sort of compressed hyphae, and it needs a chilling requirement. So it sits on the ground all winter long. And then in the next spring, right around the time the forsythias bloom, it produces these cups that produces more spores that cause that shoot blight. So um, the uh, way you can tell them, tell if berries are infected now is um, if you cut open blueberries and you see this white star shaped um, pattern in the blueberry, that's infected with um, mummy berries. So we try to um, get the growers to pick any infected berries so they don't drop to the ground. Um, always you miss some. So we uh, advise that before the forsythias bloom next spring, cover the um, blueberries, the blueberry ground around the blueberry plant with about three inches of mulch and that'll bury these sclerotia so they won't produce spores the next spring. Uh, some Cultivars are more resistant than others. So you might see the disease in one that um, was flowering just at the right time. So that's a pretty destructive disease of blueberry. Oaks got hit really hard by that frost. Oh my gosh, I got so many calls about, everybody thought they had oak wilt disease, which we don't have yet in the state, but um, for some reason, oaks were just at the right time of their development when that frost came along and just totally got zapped. And I went to Montpelier right afterwards and yeah, it looked like a big blight had occurred in all the oak trees. They were just really slow to, uh, they looked dead, but um, you know, I just said, you know, just hang on, they're gonna leaf back out and all these plants did leaf out, but the oaks, a lot of times when they, produce those new leaves. They're really uh, kind of light pink. I think it's an anthocyanin movement thing, but people were very concerned about the pink leaves, but uh, they generally turn green over the course of the summer. So oaks were pretty hard hit, um, but they have grown out of it. And the other big story for this uh, summer has been rain, lots of rain. And Chittenden County, where I live, Boy, I feel like we really dodged a bullet, although Intervale Farms are, uh, yeah, it's really sad. They've lost everything down there. Um, but with lots of rain comes lots of diseases and other problems. And this is something that somebody had mentioned. They've had a lot of problems with slugs and snails. Um, they love the wet, cloudy weather. They cause a lot of damage in hostas. Slugs typically cause those holes. And you can usually figure out if it's slugs, if you shine a light or look at the leaf in the light, you can sort of see this slime trail if it's a slug. Um, the other pest that really likes damp, cloudy, wet weather are earwigs, and they can cause um, a lot of damage on foliage, but they typically eat the foliage and then leave just the ribs. The um, They skeletonize they take everything but the um, midribs of the plant. And again, they uh, really like this kind of wet, cloudy weather. And basically to control slugs, you can use the organic uh, sluggo iron phosphide, sluggo or escargot um, around important plants. I, I've heard diatomaceous earth uh, will help deter them. But basically for both slugs and earwigs, you're trying to get rid of habitat. And so you can trap them by putting out shingles and you know having them collect under shingles and then destroying them, things like that. So that's that's been a real problem. One of my it's interesting, one of my hosta plants, one cultivar just looks horrible, and the one right next to it is barely touched. So they definitely have feeding preferences um, on their uh, plants. The other thing that we see a lot with wet weather is anthracnose, uh, and anthracnose is a fungus disease that attacks oak, ash, maple, and sycamore, and it typically causes this blighting, uh, usually along the, um, the veins, because the veins are a little bit depressed, 
So the water collects there and then the fungi spreads from there. And it looks really bad right now. Um, oh, I've also seen it on birch. It looks bad, but it's not really gonna hurt the plant that much. They may, in some years I've seen defoliation in maples from this, but um, it just looks more unsightly than anything else. Slime molds, lots of slime molds with this wet weather. Slime molds are so cool. They're a, like a primitive fungus-like organism and they cause that bright yellow, neon yellow um, <clears throat> kind of mass, usually on mulches, on grass. It's called the dog vomit <laughs> slime mold. Um, so it's really bright yellow. And then within a day or two, it sort of dries out and then it becomes kind of tan colored. You can just break them apart with a rake. They really don't hurt anything. They're not pathogenic. They can cause problems when they grow over plants and, and uh, block out sunlight, but that's really the only, uh, their only real problem. This is one, um, a lot of times I get calls from strawberry growers, and this is a slime mold that's grown on <clears throat> their uh, stems and petioles of the of the strawberry. And again, it's not pathogenic. It's just using that as a substrate, but it looks it looks like a, a bad disease. The good news about this rain is that we really have not heard much about spongy moth this year. So, you know, that's a cyclical pest. We've had them the last two years, but as we have more rain, um, the fungi and the viruses that attack the, this pest increase. So we've, um, we've definitely had rainier weather and so I think a lot of the um, spongy moths are killed by the fungi or, uh, or viruses. Um, the virus uh, disease causes the spongy moth to just hang upside down, like the picture on the right. The V shape, that's, I guess, the um, fungus disease causes the uh, caterpillar to die in a V shape. And then also um, the same uh, braconid wasp that attacks the tomato hornworm will also um, attack uh, spongy moths. So I've seen those on spongy moths too. So that's the good news. Hopefully we're done with those for a little while. Um, so that's good. With this wet weather, especially when it's warm and wet, we've seen a lot of fire blight damage and fire blight is a bacterial disease that, um, wiped out a, <clears throat> my pear tree last year, I believe. Um, but it likes anything in the rose family. So pears, apples, crab apples, mountain ash, raspberries, uh, cotoneaster, any of those can be susceptible to fire blight. And what happens is it um, often uh, causes the shoot to crook over and look like a shepherd's crook and look like it's just been hit by fire. It likes the bacteria likes really succulent tissue, so it usually attacks early in the season and when we have new succulent growth and then causes that blight. Um, it can kill entire trees, but the best thing to do if you've noticed that you do have some fire blight strikes in a tree is go ahead and prune those out when it's dry out and you wanna make sure you prune well below the damaged part and prune back to a side branch and make sure you um, surface sterilize your pruning shears between cuts, either with alcohol or a bleach, because every cut you make can reintroduce that bacteria into the um, healthy tissue. So, and then don't just drop it, burn it, bury it, do something like that. So that's a problem that uh, a lot of people are seeing. And especially, you know, we can still see fire blight strikes, you know, anytime we have warm, wet weather. And this disease gets moved around a lot during bloom time by bees. Uh, they pick it up on their feet and then move it to the next blossom. Uh, rainy weather, you know, fun, fungus diseases love rainy weather. You know, most fungi require that six to eight hours of leaf wetness, and we've had a lot of that. Uh, so we're seeing apple scab explode. Uh, the picture on the left is what the fungus disease, that's the leaf spot phase of the disease, causes sort of this olive brown leaf spot. Um, the apple at the top, uh, that's what the disease looks like on the fruit. And it's, um, 
you know, it's fine to use for cider, uh, but oftentimes they don't uh, get to be full size. We also, with all that wet weather, um, the uh, cedar apple rust, those um, gelatinous spore horns, the galls on the cedars stayed active for a long time this, this May. So they release spores that go to the apple host and then cause that bright yellow leaf spotting on the, on the apple host. And on the underside of the apple host is the other fruiting body where spores are released and, and they go are carried by uh, air currents back to the juniper. So we're seeing a lot of um, this in apples, crab apples. And I imagine in August, we'll probably see some early defoliation as, as we have seen in the last several years. Lots of bottom rots on vegetables. Uh, one gardener sent in, uh, I think her cabbage was showing a rot. So cabbage, lettuce, two different fungi, Rhizoctonia and Botrytis can cause these bottom rots because that's, you know, the soil's wet. And so those lower leaves get infected and then the whole head just rots. So best just to cut that off, get rid of it. And hopefully the next ones produced are, you know, it's a little bit drier. Um, in my squash, in my yellow squash, I've seen a lot of this coenephora rot. That's the picture on the right, where it gets this really fuzzy um, spore mass on the fruit. Again, just pick those, you know, toss them out of the garden, and hopefully the next one's produced, you know, it's drier, and so they don't have that problem. I have so much squash right now, though, it's, it's kind of a good thing when they rot. <laughs> Oh, this was the picture that the gardener sent in on this bottom rod of, of lettuce. It just turns into a yucky, slimy mass and is gross. And there would be no way to really prevent this. You know, it just happens when it's really wet. So, you know, sometimes if you can choose cultivars that are more upright, they'll have less of a problem with these bottom rot pathogens. Um, people are starting to harvest their garlic and their onions, and there's a lot of neck rot in the um, in alliums just because of all the wet weather. In the picture on the left, you can see those little gray spores from Botrytis, and that'll just cause that neck to just sort of melt away, and then it'll, you know, sort of extend down into the bulb. So anything like that, you don't want to even store. You could probably trim it up and eat what's there, but uh, those will not store well. And um, I guess, uh, you know, the flooding has been a really big uh, issue this past summer and Deb's been writing a lot of good fact sheets. So uh, refer to those as to what you should harvest, what you shouldn't harvest, but anything that's been flooded by, you know, offsite water, um, you don't wanna use any of that. Uh, garlic, root crops, foliar crops, you know, you just don't know what it could be contaminated with. If it's just uh, flooded from rain, then that's a different story. They're safer to eat, um, but they may die because of root rots. But in garlic, um, you know, it's getting ready to uh, harvest the stuff now. The most important thing is if something looks uh, rotted, just get rid of it. Anything that looks good, you can go ahead and um, uh, dry down. And I guess it wants to be, if for garlic, you want it about 110 degrees Fahrenheit to get it to dry down. Um, and you can actually clip the tops. They've found that that has no, uh, that doesn't affect the bulb size or anything, but that gets rid of some of the green extra mass that stays thing, keeps things uh, humid and wet. So go ahead and clip off the tops, uh, fully dry them down, provide a lot of air circulation, use fans, whatever, just to get them to dry down. And then scout, you know, go through the stuff again and again, get rid of anything that looks crummy, don't store it or eat it right away. Um, uh, this was a picture, the picture on the left is one that I got from a commercial grower. You know, after all that rain, when tomatoes are uh, ripening, they take up water really quickly and then the fruit just cracks. So that's just fruit cracking from rapid uptake of, of rainwater. And hopefully the next fruit produced will be fine. Um, but that's very common. Also, when we've had these really high temperatures, another problem in high tunnels, 
um, especially in tomatoes, is anytime you get temperatures over 85 or 90 degrees in a high tunnel, it the blossoms abort. So um, the blossoms die, and then it's, if it's really humid, like we've had this rainy weather, it's humid in there, then botrytis gets in there and can really cause problems in high tunnels. And growers, commercial growers have had a hard time trying to dry out their high tunnels just because it's so humid outside when it's constantly raining. You know, have to roll up the sides, use fans, use top venting, but um, there are a lot of losses from botrytis and, and leaf mold in high tunnels right now. This was also sent in by a master gardener. This is a common pest on crab apples, apples, birch, cherry, hawthorns, and mountain ash. I always see this as kind of a limiting factor in Honeycrisp apples. Uh, they just nailed my Honeycrisp. Um, but it's a little pest called the apple thorn skeletonizer. And usually by the time you see the damage, the pest is already gone. But uh, in the spring, the adult lays uh, eggs. Um, the overwintering moth lays eggs and then shortly after uh, the pest starts to feed and then it ties up the leaf edges so it's uh, protected inside and then it skeletonizes the uh, leaf and causes that lace-like or skeletonized appearance. So I think that it's important if you've had this damage on your fruit trees, make a note to yourself, go out earlier in the season and look for this uh, when it's just starting to feed before it's tied um, those leaves together and is protected. Uh, and you could use any organic insecticide, probably neem, a safer soap, uh, in trust, any of those would probably um, <clears throat> kill the pest, but you've got to find it uh, early. And this is what the little caterpillar looks like inside the leaf lots of frass um, and just lots of damage. And yeah, for some reason they like Honeycrisp, I noticed. Leaf miners, a lot of uh, the picture on the left was sent in by a, a master gardener and um, it was great. Uh, it's a leaf miner feeding on dock, which is probably a good thing. We don't want dock anyway, but a leaf miner, it's a pest that lays an egg uh, in the leaf and then the larvae feeds in between the two leaf surfaces. And once that larvae is inside there, it's really protected. So if you spray something, it's not gonna help at all. So um, kind of the best control is just hand picking uh, leaves. I see leaf miners a lot on columbine. They cause those really squiggly lines. That's where the larvae is fed on columbine leaves. Yeah, you can pick those leaves. Uh, you know, clean up things at the end of the summer, so maybe they don't overwinter as much. Also, we are all we always see problems in spinach uh, from leaf miners. So again, picking off the really infested leaves um, is kind of the best control. Maybe using row covers uh, to exclude the pest and rotating would help. Lots of bowl damage this year, and somebody had mentioned. Uh, in the beginning, uh, they had a lot of bunny rabbit damage too. Yeah, I've seen a lot of teenage bunnies in my um, in my yard, <clears throat> but I just lost two junipers. I guess voles love junipers. And so if you see a juniper that dies really fast in the middle of the summer, uh, probably if you dig around, it's vole damage. And I lost two of them. And sure enough, there was all this chewing damage um, in my junipers. And it was in the junipers that were in a shadier spot. So I don't know if that has an effect, you know, if if they're more inclined to be in a feed in a more shady protected spot. But um, yeah, they love junipers and they have caused lots of damage. And voles, I mean, they're really cute. They're kind of cyclical. Um, when their populations get high, then, you know, foxes and kind of coyotes sort of, um, explode too and then the populations go down but I was just looking on how to control them and they said the best thing to do for the voles is to um, line up mouse traps and put them under something like a, a piece of gutter near the plant that they're feeding on so uh, it's too late for mine I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that because I don't want to find little dead voles but um 
But yeah, if you've got some prized plant and you don't want voles to eat them. Also, just make sure it's a good note to sell yourself if uh, if you have a lot of apple trees, things like that. Um, if we're going to have a high vole population going into the winter, make sure everything is really protected uh, with hardware cloth because voles and bunny rabbits um, can do a lot of damage to fruit trees. I've seen them uh, girdle maple trees too. So keep uh, your prize trees protected uh, this fall and make sure if you can dig it into the ground a little bit, um, that's helpful. Uh, this was a, uh, we got a couple pictures of this this past spring um, before everything leafed out. It's a big gall on a blueberry stem and it's caused by the blueberry stem, stem gall wasp. And it's, you know, doesn't really hurt the plant that much, but some years can be worse than others. The uh, control is to just prune these out and destroy them uh, as you see them. But it's sort of a, a neat little pest. Club root in brassicas, a couple of growers, uh, commercial growers have had this problem this past summer. It's really a bad soil-borne disease. Uh, what happens is in your brassicas, you sort of note that they're wilting or not looking very vigorous. And then if you dig up the plant, you see these big um, abnormal galls or swellings on the roots. And um, it's really a bad disease because it can live in the soil for years and years. And I, I've gone to Nepal a couple of times and worked with growers on this disease because it's just it's in all their fields and they grow lots of brassicas and, you know, it lives in fields forever and it likes really low pH soils. And in Nepal, the soil pH was uh, in these uh, farmers fields up in, up in the foothills of the Himalayas, or it's like 4.5. So anything they can do to get that pH raised up um, would help discourage this disease. So uh, we were trying to get, you know, but lime is really expensive for farmers there. So um, we were trying to get the government to help them uh, lime their fields. But it's tough, too, for small diversified farms like in Vermont. You know, if you were just growing uh, 200 acres of brassicas, it's no problem. Yeah, you just get those fields, um, the pH raised up to seven or something and grow all the brassicas you want disease free. But We've got small diversified farms. They're rotating all the time. So it's really tricky. If you've got this in one field, you don't ever want to come back there with uh, brassicas and you don't really want to change the pH to, to really high uh, because that's not good for other crops. So it's really a, a tricky disease and, and an unfortunate disease, but kind of a beautiful one if you're a plant pathologist. Downy mildew in cucurbits, that's a disease that uh, doesn't overwinter in Vermont, but it blew up early on storm fronts this year. Usually we didn't see it. A lot of times growers will la lose their last planting of cucumbers to this disease in end of August, but it came really early this year. And it um, in cucumbers, there's a lot of good downy mildew resistance. So if you had a resistant cultivar, you might be safe, but a lot of things, a lot of growers didn't have resistant cultivars. So what the disease does, uh, it causes those sort of angular spots on the upper side of the leaf. And then if you look at the underside of the leaf, it looks dirty. Um, you see those black spores of the fungus, and that's pretty diagnostic for um, downy mildew on cucurbits. And downy mildew likes cloudy weather, uh, which we've had a, a fair amount of with all this rain. So um, <clears throat> it's really tough to control. If you're a conventional grower, there are good fungicides you can use. But if you're an organic grower, it's really a tough, you might as well give up because you'd have to spray something, get on the leaf undersides and um, upper leaf surface. And we just don't have that many good materials that would work. We also are seeing basil downy mildew too. Again, you see those yellow spots. It almost looks like, could look like cold damage. It could look like nutritional injury on the top of the basil leaf. But then if you turn it upside down, it looks like dirt all over those 
um, under leaf undersides. And that's typical of a downy mildew. And again, there's not much you can do at this point. Once you're infected, you're kind of done. There are some basils that are resistant. They're not immune, but they're resistant to the disease. And I've heard that they don't taste as good, that people don't like them uh, as much for pesto, but um, that's that's a, a tool you can use, is get some use some of these uh, resistant cultivars. So downy mildew is very different from powdery mildew. Um, they're two totally different uh, pathogens, gene, two different genus and species. Powdery mildew is here to some extent every year. It overwinters here. And powdery mildew you'd typically see as that white uh, sporulation on the top of leaves. We see it a lot in cucurbits and pumpkins, lilacs, phlox. Uh, it was a real problem in tomato high tunnels one year. Uh, but if you look at the leaf undersides, you can see that white powdery growth sometimes on the leaf undersides too. And uh, a lot of growers get concerned. They see powdery mildew in their cucurbits, and then they see it in another crop like their tomatoes, and they say, oh my gosh, it's spread from the cucumbers to the tomatoes. Um, and that's not true. Powdery mildews and most pathogens are really host specific. So a powdery mildew that attacks a cucumber will not is not the same powdery mildew that attacks a tomato. It lo just looks like it's spreading from crop to crop because they all kind of like the same conditions, which is, you know, warm and humid. So that's why they all sort of show up at one time. But they are very different pathogens. And these pathogens, powdery mildew, uh, need living tissue uh, to survive. So once the host is dead, it doesn't, it won't survive. Uh, this is a, a problem that we got sent. I, I don't think it was through Ask Extension, but it was a home gardener that sent me these pictures and it was on a pear, uh, no, a plum leaf. And is this pest causing all this damage? And I thought, uh, you know, I looked, glanced at it quickly and I thought, oh my gosh, it's pear slug. Um, but it wasn't pear slug. Once you look closer, you know, you can see little legs on that uh, larvae on the the black one up at the top of the um, picture. So I sent it to Margaret and uh, Margaret um, figured out that it was a, a leaf beetle. Like there's one, a willow leaf beetle and an elm leaf beetle. They sort of feed in gregarious uh, in masses and uh, they do all this damage really fast. So uh, that was a new one for me, just uh, a leaf beetle that at first glance I thought was gonna be a slug pear slug. All this wet weather, you know, starting around the first week in July, we start seeing the leaf spot diseases um, <clears throat> and they start lower in the plant because the uh, pathogen overwinters on fallen tomato leaves, dead tomato leaves. And so the rain, um, with rain, it, the spores splash up onto the lower leaves. And then with each weather event, rain event, the spores move higher up in the plant. And early blight is one of the fungi that cause a disease. It's called early blight caused by alternaria. And it has that sort of target shaped look to the spot with often uh, they're bigger, uh, they can be pretty big leaf spots with an advancing yellow margin. And then the other one, I just got this picture sent to me by a gardener, or maybe it was on Ask Extension. These little black spots, that's the other tomato leaf spot disease called septoria leaf spot. And it's a different pathogen, but they both kind of operate the same way. They overwinter on the dead tissue, they splash up onto the lower leaves, and then with each rain event, they move higher in the plant. So this is pretty extensive. Um, so I always get the question, can you just pick off those lower leaves to get rid of the spores? But we don't see all the places those spores have already landed and they're starting to infect. But one thing you can do, anything you can do to improve air circulation, like good staking, pruning the uh, foliage up to the first leaf, um, fruit cluster is good. Uh, you know, prune out the suckers, anything to get more air in there and get the plants to dry off quicker will help. Um, none of us like to spray fungicides, but if you wanted to um, 
spray copper is the best organic fungicide to use. You could probably spray, you know, maybe for three critical weeks in the middle of the summer and then kind of slow the disease down. That might be a worthwhile thing to do. Um, and it might buy you enough time and good healthy tissue to get your uh, tomatoes ripened um, by the end of the season. But um, what was I gonna say? I forget what I was gonna say. Uh, oh, when you use a fungicide on a tomato plant, there are conventional ones like uh, Bravo or chlorothalonil that you can use too. You always, you have to spray really regularly, like with copper, it's every five to seven days. Bravo, it might be seven to 10 days, but you're always trying to protect that new tissue. You can't spray a fungicide and cure any of that that's already there. You're just protecting the new tissue from infection. So, um, and it really does not take many leaves to ripen uh, tomato fruit. So, you know, you can, uh, have a lot of disease in a plant, but still get ripe fruit. But um, it might be, if you've got this much disease, it might be worth a couple sprays of copper in the mid season. And a good rule of thumb too, is when you use a fungicide, if you get an inch of rain, that fungicide is washed off. So you need to reapply. Uh, fungicides are formulated though, with small rains to sort of redistribute and stay on the leaf. But if we get a gully washer there, you know, all bets are off. You've got to reapply the, the fungicide. Hornworms are starting to show up now. Uh, this one is, uh, I just wrote a little press release about hornworms. There's tobacco hornworm and tomato hornworm. Um, I think tobacco hornworm, I think tomato hornworm has a black spine or horn and the uh, tobacco one has sort of an orange one. Um, I think this one was a tobacco hornworm, but, uh, you know, hand pick them. You can use a black light to get those white uh, stripes to glow in the dark. That's a great way that uh, high tunnel growers try to find them. Um, but if you see one that's covered with pupae of this wasp, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, leave those because those wasps are already eating out the inside of that um, caterpillar and if you leave it, it'll the wasps will complete their life cycle and then be around to uh, attack uh, caterpillars next year. Uh, the picture on the right, we're starting to get our first tomatoes. A lot of times our first tomatoes show this physiological disorder called blossom end rot. And it's uh, um, due to um, poor calcium movement within the fruit. Doesn't mean that you're low in calcium in the soil but it's just movement uh, in the fruit. So a lot of times it's the first um, tomatoes because it's uh, caused by fluctuating soil moisture and the plant hasn't figured things out. It seems like in the very first fruit, the, usually the next ones produced are fine, but anything you can do to even out soil moisture will help, you know, using a mulch, um, irrigating, but if you have a fruit like this, best to just pick it off, get rid of it, and just wait for the next one. So you'll, you'll have plenty of healthy looking tomatoes. Uh, this was another uh, question I think that we just got on Ask Extension, which was a new one for me. It was an azalea uh, that was um, having all this leaf damage. And azalea as a problem, I've seen problems with saw flies just totally um, uh, defoliate azaleas, but this had a, a, a single pest um, and it was tying the leaves together. And we had the home gardener um, send us a picture once the leaves were pulled apart. And so we could see what was in there. And it's an oblique banded leaf roller, which is a um, commonly a fruit pest, but it's uh, it ties leaves together so it can feed uh, without um, you know predators getting to it or sprays getting to it. So that was an interesting one for me. It was, uh, and the way to control it would be, you know, before it, it ties up the leaves or hand pick, probably be easy enough to hand pick these and just uh, get rid of them. This is a picture, kind of a cool picture I just got yesterday from a grower, commercial grower harvesting their potatoes and he said, oh my gosh, what are these white things all over my potatoes? And um, 
these are just enlarged lenticels. And that happens uh, when you harvest potatoes when the soils are wet. So if he waited a few days to harvest, you know, those lenticels, uh, they're a place for gas exchange. They'll, they will settle down and you won't see them like this. But that's that was kind of a, a neat picture. So just don't harvest potatoes when they're wet or else just be ready to see these lenticels. Lots of onion leek moth out there. Um, uh, so this is, uh, right now it's time for the second flight. The first flight has already uh, done their damage. It causes that window painting. Um, they feed inside the hollow leaves. The pupae is on the right. It's kind of a net covered pupae, which is um, sort of cool. And you can just hand pick those, squish them. They tend to like garlic scapes. Uh, so if you're harvesting onions, the second flight can be can get into the bulbs. But again, you can they've found that you can top onions and without causing any damage to the onions and get rid of any uh, leek moths that might be going into storage. So that's a good good thing to do. This is what the pest looks like. It's a little teeny weeny caterpillar with spots, causes a lot of damage. Basically, row covers. Uh, can be used, but once they're feeding inside those leaves, it's hard to do any control other than uh, hand picking or squishing. Sweet midge, we've gotten a few samples of these in the clinic. What happens, They this little pest just attacks brassicas, the growing point of brassicas. And so what you see is sort of a rotting mess right down in the growing point of your brassica. And usually you smell it before you see it. And this little, uh, the larvae, the adult lays an egg right at the growing point. The larvae feeds and causes scarring along the stem or on the petioles. And then uh, soft rotting bacteria move in and then just rot out the, the uh, center. And it's more of a problem on fall brassicas probably than early season brassicas. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of times, you know, if you see a lot of uh, secondary heads, that's because of Swede midge, because they've killed the main growing point. Um, yeah, and looking for that brown scarring is a good clue. Again, long rotations, uh, rotations at least three miles away, row covers, all those things can kind of help with that pest. Okay, wilting cucumbers. So if you have a bunch of wilting cucumbers or cucurbits, a few things could be going on. Um, it could be, uh, well, you might see wilting cucumbers from waterlogged soils because a lot of plants wilt in waterlogged soils because they can't pull up, there's not enough oxygen to pull up water. So they just wilt because they can't, can't pull up water. So that's one reason. Another reason could be really droughty soils. You know, if there's not been rain, you can see wilt wilted cucumbers and typically they recover at, in the evening, they perk back up. But the other thing you should always check when you see wilted uh, cucurbits is um, squash vine borer and a bacterial wilt disease. So squash vine borer, that is a pretty depressing pest because you get your, your plants are just ready to start producing all this fruit um, and all of a sudden they wilt. So you look at the base of the plant and if you see a lot of this orangish frass droppings and plant material, uh, if you look in the base of the plant, you'll, you'll find this big, big larvae. It's the size of your finger. It's huge. Um, doesn't start out huge, but <laughs> uh, usually by the time you find it or you see the plants wilting, the, the larvae is really huge. Um, so you want to make sure that you get rid of that plant, destroy the larvae. You don't want it to overwinter. Um, there's only one generation of these a year. And I don't know, they've, I've heard that you can put sort of um, uh, aluminum foil around the base. Uh, you can spray the base with an insecticide, but I don't, you'd have to spray all the time. But I, some, I'd like to try that aluminum foil around the base. And if you caught it early enough as the uh, larvae was just starting to feed, you can dig them out. But usually I don't find them until it's too late. So that's a huge pest. And the other pest, if you've had a lot of uh, cucumber beetles, um, these beetles 
uh, can carry this bacterial disease in their gut. And when they feed, they infect the cucumbers and then cause this rapid wilt of the plant. And there's um, a diagnostic uh, way to di uh, diagnose this plant disease is if you cut open the stem, cut across the stem of the cucurbit plant and pull it apart slowly. If you see those strings, um, those are strings of bacterial ooze and that tells you that the bacteria is in there. It's also, uh, if I get samples of this, um, in the lab, I can cut one of those stems and look at it under the microscope and I can see the bacteria just streaming out of the tissue. Okay, I think this is the last group. Uh, I just read in the paper today, beech leaf disease has just been found in the Adirondacks right around Lake George, which is really depressing. This is a new invasive uh, disease that we're seeing in beech trees. It's not in Vermont yet, but it will be, and maybe we probably just haven't found it yet, but it's a disease that causes this banding, this uh, dark banding in the leaves, and it can kill trees within uh, six years. It's so devastating. It can attack any beech uh, tree, causes those striped leaves in the spring. It thins out the canopy. Sometimes in the spring, it causes curling of, of the foliage thickening and curling of the foliage. Um, and our beaches trees don't need another problem. I mean, they've been uh, battling this beech bark disease that's weakened them over time. It's a scale insect and a fungus disease. And now this beech leaf disease is coming in and I'm just afraid it's gonna wipe out all of our beach, beach trees, really causes thinning of canopies. So if anybody sees this symptom, let me know, we'd like to find it. Um, but it's a foliar nematode, which is seems so weird. And they think um, foliar nematodes can cause problems in hostas and chrysanthemums. And the way you can uh, diagnose foliar nematodes, other than seeing the actual nematode, but a lot of times it causes banding, dead banding in the leaves because they can't cross over the leaf veins. So that's pretty distinctive for a foliar nematode problem. And it, it's moving around so fast, this disease that they think it must be spreading by birds because it's just moving really fast. So uh, I think that's all I have. So yeah, that's diseases and pests in a nutshell. Um, that was, yeah. yeah, that was wonderful. And gosh, there's so much information. I'm glad we recorded this so we can go back and take a look if we have questions <laughs> or if uh, if we have uh, clients that we're trying to help as well. Um, there were a few questions in the chat. So let me, um, and we do have about 10 minutes. So let me just get to those. Hold on. Uh, just, just trying to just minimize some things so I can see them. Um, we do had one question at the beginning about Blue Lake pole beans are dying on the vine. Um, do you have any ideas why um, that might be happening? Well, uh, I guess if you're not seeing any Mexican bean beetle or any pest feeding on the foliage, um, I would look at the root system. And, uh, you know, the, it can, there are a lot of root rots in bean plants. So I would suspect something's going on in the roots. I don't know if they had a lot of wet, you know, weather standing water. Um, but I suspect it's something in the root system. Great, thank you. Could be a seed corn maggot too, uh, you know, feeding on the roots, but if they're already getting beans, um, it's probably too late for a maggot. But yeah, I would look there and the person is welcome to uh, dig it up and send me a picture too, if they want me to take a closer look at, at what's going on in the roots. Great. Thank you. And then um, what's your best recommendations for powdery mildew um, management? And then um, the, the, they're asking, why do I have to spray the underside of the leaves too? Oh, for the um, downy mildew, well, and for powdery mildew, because it sporulates on the leaf underside. So you want to kill all those spores. And that's what's tricky, even for commercial growers to get on those, you know, to spray on those leaf undersides. Um, so for powdery mildew uh, control, we're lucky that there are a lot of good organic 
controls for powdery mildew. I mean, the first thing you want to do is um, look for a resistant cultivar, depending on what you're growing. Like there's powdery mildew resistant phlox, and I don't know about lilacs, but uh, and powdery uh, mildew resistant cucurbits. So look for that. That's a good line of defense. Plant those. Also, anything you can do to improve air circulation, spread plants apart, keep them thinned out. Um, that's another good thing to do with powdery mildew. But then if you have to spray, uh, if you want to control it, again, you're protecting the new tissue. You're not going to cure anything. Um, you know, there are Baking soda uh, based sprays, Armacarb is a fungicide that's a baking soda uh, based spray. Neem oil can also control powdery mildew. Um, some of the stylet oils, horticultural oil, all those will control powdery mildew. And uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the plants are growing so fast that there's always new healthy tissue being produced and you'll still get a get a good crop, but um, yeah, I know, I remember with commercial growers growing pumpkins, they were uh, concerned about powdery mildew because they don't want powdery mildew to attack the uh, handles of the pumpkins because then that leads to other rot. Mm -hmm. So they were, um, they would spray for powdery mildew in pumpkins just to try to keep the handles uh, protected. Great. And um, net powdery mildew is different than downy mildew, but I just wanted to mention that um, some of our master gardeners uh, participated in some community science work um, headed out of Cornell on downy mildew. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'll send a, a follow up. Um, they're still looking. Um, we'll always look for help with uh, detection of downy mildew and cucurbits and uh, basil. So you can be part of the research solutions um okay so I'm, I'm sorry i had asked the question about the powdery mildew i wondered if i could ask a quick follow-up uh very quick gordon because we have several other questions in the queue I, the suggestions for the underside of the leaves i mean it kind of frankly sounds like a cruel joke i don't know other than lifting up each individual leaf and spraying it they grow to the ground you know, I know. There's, 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 you're just you right. Do the best you can. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's all it is. Yeah. It's, you know, I think, uh, yeah, it's really tough and we don't have for the commercial growers, you know, a lot of the sprayers, they use boom sprayers or, you know, it's just tough. It doesn't really get on the leaf undersides very well. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm how keeping up the fertility too on some of these plants so they don't totally run out of gas. You want them to be um, fertile enough to keep producing, you know, more leaves. So that's probably a good thing to do is just make sure you're keeping up the fertility. And speaking of Gordon, Gordon did suggest that the he's had success with the aluminum foil around the base for squash vine borers. So thank oh, you. Oh, good. I'm gonna thank you, I'm Gordon. gonna do that tonight. I'm gonna go out because I think I have some butternut squash. I can't. You know, I planted all these cucurbits. I can't remember what I planted. So <laughs> I'm hoping there's some butternut squash out there. <laughs> Okay, um, let's move on to swede midge. Does swede midge come in through this throughout the season, or do are we do we expect to see it at one point in the year? Oh, usually it's a well. I I forget. I should have read up. I think it has a couple generations. So, um, a lot of times we see it in the first uh, brassicas, but then again, it's also a problem in the fall brassicas. So. Uh, and it's usually a bigger problem in the fall brassicas. So, yeah, I think it can be a problem all season just because of the two generations. And I'm about to send out a um, one of Vic Izzo's um, weekly pest oh, okay. updates. So I'll look into, you know, uh, Vic does a lot of research on that pest in particular. So we can try to dig up some information um, about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm not quite sure about this yellowing of paper birch leaves. Maybe you could type in what um a little bit more about that. 
Um, do you have any recommendations on how to deal with cu uh, cucumber sorry. beetles? That's okay. Cucumber sorry. beetles. Any um, should plants be trashed or taking two hundred and feet, two hundred fifty feet away from the garden enough? Oh, in terms of uh, infected, affected. Oh, you know what? It seems like plants come back, you know, perennial plants come back pretty well after getting fed upon by Japanese beetles. So I don't know that I would get rid of any infested plants. But I, I'm I'm sorry. She said cucumber beetles. Oh, cucumber beetles. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, uh, I guess I would try um, Pyganic as a an organic control uh, for cucumber beetles. And what was the question? Should she? Should those plants be trashed or taking 200 feet away um, uh, uh, from the garden enough? So in terms of disposing of affected plants, should she go uh, ahead and like put them in the trash or should she just try to remove them from the site? Well, from... I try to remove them. I mean, if there are still beetles on them, they'll make their way back to other other um, cucumbers. I mean, you could bury them or or... You could, you know, maybe put them in a pile and then solarize that pile or something. Try to cook it. <laughs> uh, and then once you cooked it, you know, hopefully they, they'd be dead and you could put them in a compost. Excellent. Okay. For, um, is it okay to remove yellow dying leaves on cucurbits by cutting them off? Or does um, this leave the plant open to diseases as the stems no, are hollow? No, it's, it's probably the it's fine to clip those off, but you want to figure out why, why are the leaves dying? I mean, is it just one or two here and there, or is it a whole, is it a trend? Is the whole vine basically dying? But yeah, no, it won't, it won't invite other diseases in there. Yeah. Um, sterilizing or, you know, sanitizing no, your, sanitizing your clippers probably. Well, I mean, if bacterial wilt is in there, I suppose you could move bacterial wilt into an, a healthy plant if you were using a clipping tool or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, Okay, if my paper birch leaves are turning yellow, um, is that an indication of uh, too much water saturating the roots? Could be, could be. And uh, I would just hopefully, um, you know, it might, drop a few leaves, but uh, I wouldn't worry too much uh, because the tree's got lots of roots and hopefully it'll, you know, it's starting to dry out a little or we're not having constant rain. It's every other day now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would just hang in there and, and uh, I don't know, I've kind of, this rain, you know, at least in Chittenden County, it's been so nice for my um, trees and shrubs and garden, but uh because we just haven't had the deluges that everybody else has, but mm -hmm. um, but hopefully your tree will just bounce back. Might lose a few leaves. Well, we, my friends, are at time. I'm just going to pop in the um, the chat. Um, we have our uh, feed of re uh, press releases that come through, and many of them have been um, of late have been authored by Anne. Um, so if you want. Um, she mentioned a release that she's just working on that hasn't quite come out yet, but you'll see it in that feed. There's something on slime molds. Um, we had something on tomatoes recently as well. So th that's a really good spot for looking for um, advice from Anne and also um, our helpline, of course, if you have questions, um, you as a master gardener, welcome to um, pop a question into our helpline um, or contact Anne directly. And with that, thank you, Anne. You're yeah, so awesome. You. And you make thank learning you. about insects and diseases fun. And yeah, and everybody's welcome to email me, whatever. Okay. okay. Alrighty. Thanks all. Thank Have you. a great day. Bye. Bye.